Okay, well, I will use the, the slides this time. And I put together a little, I don't know what you call it, a little vignette uh, to kind of summarize the, the notion that what we've been talking about, we're going to move on from there, but just to refresh ourselves that God is the God uh, of life. Okay. You know, Charles Darwin uh, said that when he, when he saw a peacock's feather, it made him sick. And the reason was because to look at the, the grandeur of life, uh, and even just the few pictures there, the exquisite beauty, and the unity of all of the diversity that you saw there, plus uh, a number of those pictures that talk about or express at least this notion that God created life and gave it the agency of life, uh, delegated to it uh, the responsibility to bring forth fruit. And all that fruit brings glory uh, to God. Well, how are we to flourish? Um, this is something I think we as evangelicals need to remind ourselves that in the very beginning... When God created us, he created us and called us to flourish physically. This is the fruit of the loom. Excuse me, the fruit. <laughs> I didn't say that. I didn't say, I didn't say that. The fruit of the womb. The fruit of the womb. That God 
God has made us, uh, that's what he said in Malachi. He said that he brought together the man and the woman because he was seeking godly offspring. He was seeking godly fruit. This is the God of life. This is the God who has a sacrificial zeal that seeks the shalom of his creatures. And we are to celebrate that. You and I live in a culture. I, I deal with my college students all the time, and, I, and you know this as well. They are turning away from this. Not only turning away from marriage, but even if they get marriage, they're not sure whether or not they want to have kids. The, this is part of the, the enemy's work uh, to get us to deny. Remember the, how things are tipped now? And they're tipped towards death and destruction. They're tipped towards barrenness. They're tick, pick, tick, tick. Say it. Say it for me, please. Thank you. And I didn't eat that cookie either. I, you know, I, if I'd eaten that chocolate, I'd be a whole lot better off right now. So the first area is that we are to be fruitful physically. The second, and this is really critical for us, especially in evangelical Christianity, we are to be fruitful vocationally. And we are to recognize that God put Adam in the garden to work it. And that vocational work is divine in the sight of God. Now, I told you I was going to say some things that, are, that will sound critical, I want them to be received more from the standpoint of let's take a look at the state of the church, for example. Because I guarantee you that if you are a plumber growing up in our evangelical church, as you will get the overriding sense that if you become a plumber, you have not really sold out to God. Do you know what I mean by this? I know you know what I mean by this. My college students know it all the time. I'll talk to a college student, and I'll say, hey, I see you're in uh, electrical engineering. He says, oh, yeah, yeah, I, re I really enjoy that. And I say, you know, what aspect do you really like in that? He said, oh, I like, I like studying power systems and how to make power systems and more efficient and so forth. And I said, well, that's great. Do you have any idea what you do after you graduate? He said, oh, well, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll use that um, on the mission field. And I'll say, you didn't have to say that. But he feels like he has to say that. You know why he feels he has to say that? Because we have made him believe that there is the sacred realm and there is the secular realm and that if you really love God you will go into the sacred realm but if you love money you'll go into the sacred realm now we don't put it that starkly but I guarantee you I can t my I'll, I'll stay here my college students believe that why because they've been taught that You know, if a young man or a young woman in our church decides that she or he is going to go to seminary, we will call them forward and pray for them. We will lay hands on them. We will even have a potluck for them. We'll send them off with our blessings and prayers and so forth. But if the guy says he's called to be a plumber, what will we do? Nothing. This, quite frankly, my friends, is disgusting. Because we are essentially teaching the body of Christ that says that if you are not part of the secular realm, your only part in the kingdom of God is to make money and bring it into the coffers. That's disgusting. And when we are teaching our children, if a child is bent towards, if they're made by God, if they're made to be a fig tree or they're made to be a peach tree, don't try to force them into some secular thing. I teach at a seminary. You know what one of my main jobs in the seminary? Is to get guys out. 
Because when I find a guy who's sitting in my seminary class who's there because he thinks that's because he loves God and that's what you do if you love God, I'll do everything to get him out, especially if I know he's supposed to be farming. And the other thing, see, see, if we were, and I don't mean to spend too much time on this, but it's important for us. It's important for us. You know, if we were to ask Luigi to come before uh, the church on, on this coming Sunday, this, Luigi, we want you to come uh, and give testimony as to how you glorify God by making shoes. You know what Luigi's going to do? What do you think Luigi is going to have to say? Well, I'll have to tell him about how I, uh, how I witness to my customers or how I just decided that I'm going to put a verse on every shoe that I make from now on. <laughs> and you know why Luigi thinks he has to say that? Because he sees no kingdom value in making shoes. We need to help people understand that if God has made you to be a shoemaker, if he's made you to be a farmer, there is no higher spiritual calling than that. There is nothing more divine than that. And don't feel like you have, if you're a Christian baker, feel like you've got to put a cross on every cupcake. We are called to glorify God by the fruit of the labor of our hands. And that brings glory to God. And finally, we are called to be fruitful ministerially. Not simply the cleric. See, we have turned the church upside down. If we read the blueprint in the design for the church in Ephesians chapter 4, see if this doesn't sound familiar to you now. God gave the pastors and the teachers, the leaders, so that they would equip the saints and the saints would then do the work of ministry. We have turned that upside down and we now think that the saint's job is to equip the staff and the staff does the work of ministry. And if we see a, a new ministry needs to be done, we'll hire a new staff person. That simply is the work of the enemy, I believe, in order to destroy the fruit of the body of Christ. Now, a little personal testimony. When I was at the White House, that's when the Lord reached down and exposed me. And he grabbed me. He reached inside, and he, he squeezed my heart uh, so badly. He broke my heart, and he broke my heart because of the state of the body of Christ. That we were anemic, we were weak, we were not light and salt. We were no longer changing. We were no longer turning our world upside down. And he broke my heart for that. And I left the White, I left the White House early. Made a lot of people mad. But I left early because the call was so strong on me. And I'm not telling you that for me. I'm just, I'm just saying that God desires. He, he's the one who died for the body of Christ. And he has a vision for her. And that vision is that he has equipped us, he has empowered us, not just the cleric, you and me, with the Spirit of God, that we might bring forth fruit before him. That's his design. And when we follow that design, it's amazing what will happen. We're turning all of the social institutions upside down. And that's what happens. When you reject the meta narrative and you reject absolute truth, then that is what happens. So we're called to be fruitful physically, we're called to be fruitful vocationally, and we're called to be fruitful ministerially, all of us. 
So the meta-narrative and the counter-narrative, we'll do this briefly. We want to talk about these two. Remember that in the meta-narrative, what we've been submitting to you for your consideration is that this meta-narrative of God is directed towards life. And the truth is therefore not the end game of God, though we would like for it to be, because that's easy, right? You can just go add more pages to your truth notebook, and then go home. Open up your garage door, pull in, door go down, turn on your air conditioner, and you don't even have to speak to your neighbor. But truth is meant to bring forth not only fruit in your life, but in turn, you are to have a sacrificial zeal that seeks the shalom of another. Well, there's a counter-narrative. Lies are not Satan's end game. His lies seek to destroy your fruit. That's why the church is upside down. That's why we destroy the babies in the womb. That's why we're creating marriages that will have no fruit. Without truth, everything will continue to simply flow towards death and destruction. And if you choose to float in this world, I guarantee you where you'll end up. If you choose to float in your relationship with your spouse, guess where it will go? You know, don't get upset by this. You know, if you're a gardener and you go outside one day and you see there are weeds out there and you throw your hoe down and stomp off because you hoed the thing last week, and by golly, I'm sick of this stuff. These weeds, they just keep coming. You will never be a good gardener. And you recognize that the world that we live in, as Paul said, the world we live in is tipped now. It's in decay. That's what the second law of thermodynamics tells us. It is a universe that is tipped in that direction. And we have to swim against it. We have to swim against it every day. You have to swim against it in your own life. You have to swim against it in your relationships with your spouse and your children. You have to swim against it in your classroom. We have to swim against it in our church. We have to swim against it in our country. You have to swim against it in your business if you're in business. So let me give you, now let's bring this to educate for just a second. Although I'm sure, I hope, that you've been making a lot of applications because there are many of them there. I'm fascinated by Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary. I use it all the time. I go back and read those definitions. And I want to show you the difference between the modern definition for educate and the old 1828. And let's see if we can see any difference there, besides the fact that one has a lot more words. Here is the, and it may be hard to read, but I'll, I'll, I'll read it for you. Here is the modern uh, definition of educate, to give intellectual, moral, and social instruction. This is what you will find in the 1828 Dictionary of Noah Webster. Educate is to bring up as a child, to instruct, to inform, enlighten the understanding, to instill in the mind principles of art, science, morals, religion, and behavior. To educate children well is one of the most important duties of parents and guardians. Now, what, is, what do you see as the main difference between these two definitions? Especially in light of what we've been talking about. Yes? The difference now is it's the teachers, not the parents. Okay, one is, one could be that it's the teacher, although that's not necessarily implied. It could be a parent. But I agree, in our culture, it has become that. What else, what else here? Real, and really important. What do you see the difference here? Pardon me? Well, it is, it is specific to a child in Noah Webster's, but that's not, yeah, it, it could be the other one is implying that as well. Yes? Well, 
Yes. Okay, it doesn't stop. Let's go just a little deeper there, though. In the first definition, how would you consider yourself successful as an educator? If you do what? Give instruction. If you give instruction, you have educated. What would, what would the 28 Noah Webster say about that if you just gave instruction? Pardon me? Yeah, there's, in other words, that, and I don't, we're, we can read maybe too much in here, but in light of what we've been talking about in terms of who God is, the nature of God, and it goes back to what we're saying, truth is not the end game. See, I would submit to you that the definition on the left there, truth, except it may not be truth. No, it could be instruction. Instruction is the end game. The end game is to simply get through the material, deliver the stuff, and you are, you check it off. You did your stuff today. And what I want to submit to you is that that is contrary to the very nature of God in terms of what he intends for you and me to do, especially when you are in this awesome position and not let many of you become teachers, my brethren, because you will be held to a higher account. But your job and your role before God is not simply to give instruction. You and I need to be involved in, in the educational process that sees as best we can that the truth that we deliver will bring forth fruit in the life of that child. And to do it in such a way as best it depends upon you to make that happen. You can't check it off because you just gave it. Okay, we're beating the horse now. And I love horses. I don't want to beat horses. Okay, we'll refer to this again. So let, let's go through three things quickly here. <coughs> the consequences associated with what happens when we reject the meta narrative, especially when we reject the meta narrative as a culture. And again, that's a symptom of rejecting the meta narrative as individuals, but there are consequences that come when a culture rejects the meta narrative. The first is, and we've already talked about this, that the only script that gets left is my script. And then it becomes all about me, all about my script. And I then set up these expectations. We've already talked about this, just kind of review, that I begin to believe wholeheartedly that my script is going to lead to all of these things we were talking about. Significance, happiness, uh, purpose in life, um, pleasure, joy, all that stuff. And of course we said, yeah, the problem with that is that it doesn't work. And we are so stupid, we get up every day and write it again. And that is why we live in a culture in which we see the manifestation, maybe even our own life, but you may see it in your student's life, in the people around you. We get angry, bitter. You know what complaining is? We didn't talk about it. Complaining, complaining has everything to do with your script and how it's supposed to go. If you find yourself complaining, I'll tell you that's what's up. That's what's going on. Disillusioned, discouraged, despair, depression, hopelessness, impatience. I know you don't ever get impatient, but there are some people who do get impatient. And when they do get impatient, it's because they write their script with a timeline. Blame. We live in a culture where the victim has, has been endowed with great power. All you have to do is show yourself, somebody stepped on my script. Or you, become, you have this mentality that I'm the victim. Why? Because everybody keeps stepping on my script. Worry. You know what worry is? 
Worry is someone will step on my script. <laughs> they haven't yet, but it's going to happen. I'm worried about it. Oh, this is big. After you try. See, we've raised a generation. The generation from the 40s on down have been raised in a culture that basically from birth said it's all about you. We live in a world where technology says it's all about you. We tell them over and over again that these are things that will fulfill your script and make you happy and, and joyful and content and all that stuff and it doesn't happen. And at some point, you know what? You just give up. And you end up saying, whatever. Has anybody ever heard that? Whatever. That is a statement from somebody who is at the point of saying, I don't care anymore. I can't, I, my script is, I can't ever get my script. Over. Whatever. Diarrhea. Psoriasis. Scoliosis. Okay, I'm kind of kidding, but not really. Not really. You know, physicians will tell you how much of our physical problems come from the result of everything before this. But I want to talk specifically, and we'll come back to this in a few minutes, and that is the rise of skepticism in our culture and where that comes from. Let's talk about that for just a second. Because if, especially when you talk about the 40-year-old and, and down, if you were raised in a culture that basically has said from the beginning it's all about you, it's all about your script, it's all about getting your script fulfilled, then they begin, and my college students know, the week get to this point, they, know, they are in their, on the edge of their seats because they know. I know something about you. I know that you are trying to manipulate me to enhance your script. And the reason I know that you're trying to manipulate me to enhance your script is because I'm trying to manipulate you to enhance my script. And all of a sudden you realize that you are in a culture where everyone is a salesman. Everyone is trying to sell you on something that basically is to enhance their script. And they know it. Why? Because they see the ads all the time. You buy these jeans, and you, everybody is going to look at you, and you will be significant, right? And they bought the jeans, and guess what? <laughs> Nobody paid any attention. <laughs> well, this, this, is a, this becomes very serious because what this results in is the loss of relationships. I, I, I tell my, oftentimes at some point when we've built enough a relationship that I can say these things to my students, the college students, I'll, I'll say something like this. I'll say, you know, you guys, and many of you here are in this generation, you are the most connected generation in all of humanity. Now, it's dangerous to say that kind of stuff because every generation thinks they are the most or the worst or whatever, da, 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 of all time. But this is true. There has never been a generation that has been so connected like this generation. I tell them, you, you know, you guys, this is part of your body. You probably even know this now. If you, if you lose this or misplace it, it's like you've lost an arm or a leg or, or your head, in my case. 
said, you are the most, con-, and I said, you're always, you're, you're always uh, communicating, you're texting. Some of you are texting right now. And somebody said, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you are the most connected generation in the history of mankind, but you are also the loneliest. And you can normally hear a pin drop. And the reason is because they know it. They have all kinds of contacts, but no real relationships. You know what Facebook is? No offense to you Facebookers. Facebook is basically, here's my story and I want you to love it. Or like it. (laughs) And then we gain significance in how many contacts we have. Or likes. You know, for years and years, the survey of women, and some of you uh, maybe pre-40s, would probably understand this, that the survey of women, the number one issue of women for years and years and years and years has been security. You know what it is now? In the last few years, they've just made a new survey. You know what the number one thing with women is? Loneliness. This, my friends, is a horrible trend because you ladies have been given by God this kind of talent and gift. You have this capability. (laughs) Men, we're just kind of grunt. You know, we don't, we don't, you, we have to, swim hard for relationships. You guys haven't had to swim at all, but something's happening. And what is happening is that you and I live in a culture that is increasingly isolating you and destroying relationships. It breeds a loss of hope, a loss of joy, a loss of happiness. It's all about me. The second consequence is uh, the notion of deep relativism. If there is no absolute truth, if there is no meta-narrative, then everyone gets to make up their own truth. And my truth is my truth, and your truth is your truth. And, of course, you know, there are consequences of that when you deny the absolute truth, and especially in the culture we live in today, that that is no longer just simply an isolated philosophy. It has, it has seeped into the deep fabric of our culture. It is the underlying assumption of virtually everything you see, movies, TV, music, public policy, There is no absolute truth. It reduces our culture to uh, an instability. If there is no absolute foundation to stand upon, uh, everyone does what is right in his own eyes. We lose the notion of an ought. If If you reject the notion of an ought, remember the Cheshire cat in uh, Alice in Wonderland? Have you heard of that, Alice in Wonderland? I mean, I always keep asking the question because, honestly, my students now don't even remember 9-11. Yes, I'm telling you, they don't even remember 9-11. So I have to keep asking this question to find out what do you know and what you don't know anymore. Remember, uh, the, the Alice comes to the fork in the road and the Cheshire cat is there and, and she doesn't know which way to go and he says, well, where are you headed? And she said... 
She didn't know where she said, well, I haven't read this. Have you read this story lately? <laughs> anyway. If she, she didn't know where she was going, he said, well, then any road will do. And, and when you lose the ought, if we lose the ought associated with the way the state should operate, then we'll, we'll create the state however we want. If we lose the ought in terms of how the family was designed, then we'll make it any way we want. Oh, if you want to after this is over, this is huge with me, but I, just because of time, we are losing in, in when we lose the meta narrative, we lose maleness. And we lose maleness primarily, and I said I wasn't going to get into this, but I'll just, we lose maleness primarily because if you look at the difference between male and female, there is a difference in terms of their, their ultimate purpose or their overriding purpose. And the male has an overriding purpose of protecting and defending. Doesn't mean the female can't protect and defend. And the female has an overriding purpose of nurture and comfort. Doesn't mean that she can't protect and defend. It doesn't mean that he can't nurture and comfort. But you know what I'm talking about. But if you wipe away the meta narrative, if you wipe away the notion of absolute truth, what does the male protect? What does he defend? What do you think? What is he left to protect and defend? His own script. And he becomes, he becomes the big boy buffoon. And most all of our TV shows now are basically about the male buffoon. In fact, we don't really want maleness because we don't want absolute truth. We don't want a male protecting anything absolute. Sorry, I wouldn't go into this, but. I used to read the Berenstein Bears to my kids. Remember the Berenstein Bears? And then all of a sudden, I realized after a while, Papa Bear is nothing but a big buffoon. <laughs> right? I mean, he is. He's like, a, he's a cub in a big body. And Mama Bear is always rolling her eyes, you know. Right? Isn't that right? And I said, I can't read this anymore to my kids. I mean, we're, we're basically showing a picture of the buffoonish male. But what I'm telling you is that comes as a result of what happens when you reject the meta-narrative. And if you want to go further to this, I'll tell you what happens in a culture. And this is nothing against femaleness. I love femaleness. But a culture can tip, when you reject that, a culture can tip hip to the nurture and comfort side. And when it does, the state, for example, which has a primary role of protect and defend, we turn the state into a nurture and comfort institution. And we demand of it nurture and comfort, not protect and defend. We don't want it to stand for absolute truth. We want to stand it stand for me. The same will happen in the church. The church, Paul says that the church is the pillar of truth. Now, it does some nurture and comfort, but I'm telling you, in the design of the church, it is primary to protect and defend the Word of God. But when it tips to a nurture and comfort institution, guess what it becomes looking like? but I wasn't going to talk about that. I have a lot of young men in my college class that don't know what it means to be a male anymore. There's no overall purpose in our culture anymore. And so they basically think, if I want to be significant, I need to be a nurturer and comforter. Now, there's nothing wrong with that because Jesus was a man of steel. But what if you... I mean, what would help in this? What would help if you had this bag of, 
of puzzle pieces, and you knew that some of these, maybe half of them weren't right. What would help you in throwing some out? Pardon me? I'm sorry. Well, I guess you could do that, but what would be easier? If you had the picture, yeah. If you had the picture, if my wife would give me the picture, I could probably throw these out a lot easier, right? You know, if you had the picture, yeah, that's right. That, that might help. That could certainly help. Would you all write a letter to my wife, by the way? But what if you couldn't see the true picture? What if it wasn't there anymore? It wasn't in your schools? It wasn't in the movies? It wasn't in the books you read? It wasn't in the music you listened to? There was no picture. What would that be like? That's what we're in. What if you believed a picture didn't exist? There is no picture. Simplifying to the extreme, a defiant postmodern as a scoffing rejection of the notion of a man and error. There is no picture. Man, I've dealt with students who believe that. It is unbelievable. It's like floating on a cork in an ocean with no shore. But what if you believed that all the pieces were good? It didn't matter. Even if you had pieces from a thousand different pictures, they're all good. That's what relativism is. Because it denies that there is any true picture. And if there is no true picture then your pieces are just as good as mine. Well, that might be okay, except there are severe consequences to that. Let me tell you about an encounter I had with a, a waitress several years ago. A young, turned out she was a young college girl. I was back in Charlotte, North Carolina. I was teaching at a, at a conference. And uh, she came up and just, you know, friendly chat like, you know, waitress will sometimes do, and she, uh, for some reason, asked where I was from and told her, I'm from Colorado, what are you doing in Charlotte? And I told her I was, I was speaking at a, a worldview conference. I think I was speaking on, on ethics, I think. And uh, that really intrigued her. And she kept coming back to the table. And it was, it was a wonderful thing. You know, she'd come back and she'd, she, because she was curious how someone could come and teach about ethics or someone that believed that there was an absolute truth. And then at some point in the conversation, she said, she said this. Oh, you can't read it. I'll, I'll read it to you. <laughs> she said, well, I wouldn't want to tell someone else that they're wrong. There are so many ways to believe. If someone really believes something, who am I to say that they aren't right? Who sets the boundaries anyway? Maybe there aren't any real boundaries. Maybe the only boundaries that exist are the ones that we place upon ourselves. Who says we can't fly? Maybe we really could if we weren't constrained by the boundaries of our own making. And at that point, I, I said, you know, I, I grew up on a on a ranch and a farm in Idaho and, and as a kid I read every Superman comic book that had ever been published I began to believe that I was Superman I believed that I could at least be the son of Superman I believed that I could fly if I just had a cape like Superman had and I made a cape and I climbed up on top of the chicken coop and I was so convinced I could fly, I jumped off of that chicken coop. I didn't even look down what was below, and I landed on an old farm implement, and it hurt. And I said, but you know, you know what's really bad is that 
I climbed up there and tried it again. <laughs> Off the other side. And I said, you know, you, just because, you know, just because you believe something doesn't make it true. There is a truth associated with that. And, and you know, this is what she said. I wrote this down. This is serious. She looked at me and she said, but what if you had tried it a third time? She was hungry to know. When I said that I believed that there was an absolute, a comprehensive truth that brought everything together, her eyes lit up. And she said, really, do you think that there's that kind of universal truth? Everything she expressed, everything she was thinking, everything she was struggling with, was bound up in the issue here before us and the consequence of relativism. In Amos we read this, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord, hearing truth. Men will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of God, searching for the truth, but they will not find it. And increasingly, we are in a world of people who are lost. And that includes evangelical Christians, in particular our kids, because they bought this notion underlying of relativism. I've got a little clip, especially for you folks who live here all the time. You have no clue what we go through <laughs> up in Colorado. <clears throat> but I just want you to suffer through it. That is so me. I mean, that's me right there. So, you know, this guy really believed that was his car, right? I mean, he sincerely believed that was his car. Relativism, quite frankly, just between us and this room is really stupid. Honestly, now you wouldn't tell that to someone, but it really is stupid. We don't live in a, in a relative world, right? I mean, you, you didn't decide to come into the auditorium through, this, through the roof or through the floor. You know, you don't put celery down your gas tank. You don't eat pizza in your ear. At least over 20 years old, you don't try to do that, but... <laughs> We live in an absolute world. And by the way, use that. Because the burden of truth is on the relativist. How can you say that, that we live in a relative world, there's no absolute truth, and everything around us screams absolute truth? The burden of proof is on them, not on us. And I don't say that, that you, you, you and I are to engage with gentleness and respect, and wisdom, and kindness, and a winsome attitude. Now, well, you can't read those, but you know all the stats anyway. <coughs> Here's the one that gets me. 70% of incoming freshmen at Christian universities believe there are no moral absolutes. And I deal with it all the time. I'm going to tell you this briefly. 
Many of you read about this in the Journal of Education. This came from, written by a guy by the name of Dr. Anderson. He's from Ontario, Canada. He teaches ethics. He went into his class one time and he was telling them the story, and you may remember the story, uh, of Abi Aisha. She was a teenage wife of a Taliban fighter. <clears throat> she tried to flee after a while, get away. She was mutilated. She was left to die. It was a horrible thing. And Dr. Anderson thought that this story would provoke, you know, kind of a clear. He was trying to get his class to recognize that there are clear ethics here at some point. And he wrote about this, and he said, instead, their response was a confusion. There was an unwillingness to make any moral judgment at all. And this is what he wrote in the journal. He said, you know, we might not like it. Uh, oh, the, the, the students say, well, we may not like it, but over there, you know, who's to say that, you know, that's wrong or right? And this is what he wrote in the journal. While we may hope that some students are capable of bridging the gap between principal morality and ethical vacuous relativism, it is evident that a good many are not. For them, the overriding message is never judge, never criticize, never take a position. And that's what we're raising. And that is not, your students are not immune to this. So there's this notion that truth and morality are not bound up in an absolute meta narrative, but they're basically the result of a culture, some social context. This is the battle of our times. It works its way out in what I call the covenant of tolerance. You know, covenant of tolerance? The covenant of tolerance is this. If if I don't tell you that what you're doing is wrong, then you don't tell me that what I'm doing is wrong. And that's the covenant that we have written. And we hate covenant breakers. A covenant breaker is someone who would dare to say there's something not right about this. Well, you know, we could spend a lot of time here on relativism. Maybe we shouldn't, but these are important things. We're walking away from just the the common sense notion of the law of non-contradiction, that you can have two different truths, and and they may be contradictory, but, uh, but that's okay, except when it comes to Christianity. And then you will be argued about contradictions in Christianity. This is, so, this is so amazing to me. You know, We can live with contradictions, but I can try to nail you to the wall because there's a contradiction in your Christianity. Well, you know, to some extent they should if there is a contradiction in our Christianity. Um, I'm going to pass up R.C. here. Um, he's got a great thing, but just because of time, I, wanna, I want to, before the bell rings, uh, which is in one minute. I don't know how that's going to happen. I was getting on a plane. I fly way too much. And United is very nice to let me kind of pick an aisle seat. And I was late getting on the plane. The plane had already boarded. And I came up to get on my, my seat in the aisle there on the exit row. And there was a lady sitting in my seat. And, uh, and I did what I thought was a winsome thing. I, I pulled out my boarding pass. And I, I looked at it. And then I... I looked at the little thing over there, and then I looked at her, and then I looked at it again, you know? And, and then all of a sudden she said, well, I was supposed to be in that seat over there, and as soon as she pointed, and that guy said, well, I was supposed to be in that seat, and there were like five people who said, well, I was supposed to And so I'm waiting for the flight attendant who finally came up, and she said, sir, you need to take your seat. We need to close the door, and I said, yeah, but I'm in, and she, and but, 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 and so I'm waiting for her to, to make this right. And I turned around, and she folded her arms. She said, sir, do you want me to make all these people move? Uh, no, show me the middle seat between <laughs> two sumo wrestlers. 
Well, you know, by the way, th my story and so on and so forth, that was a providential seat that I sat in. We can talk about it sometime if you want. But see, if she had pulled out a boarding pass that said 12B, and I had a boarding pass for 12B, that would be a contradiction. We have mysteries. We have mysteries that sometimes, like we were talking earlier, and I know I've got to quit here, it's 10 after, but, but I'm the next one up, right? <laughs> You're back in my class after the break. So if we go a little over, that's just tough. We'll start a little bit later. See, there are people who will try to make you believe or your students believe, and there was a guy who came up, and a, a great question about the students wrestling with this whole, this ocean right here is the problem of evil is basically what it is. So you got a piece in this biblical Christian worldview about God being good and powerful, but you got another piece that evil and suffering exists. And there are those who will tell you that these are a contradiction. And it would be a contradiction if they were supposed to go in the same place in the, in the puzzle. But what if you're just missing the piece that brings them together? And sometimes we don't have that piece, but it doesn't mean they're contradictions. Does that make sense? It's important to understand this. I deal with this constantly with students who somehow think there's this big contradiction in Christianity, and therefore, and many people have rejected God as a result of this. It's not a minor deal. It's not just some philosophical thing that we're talking about.